Today we're going to take a look at several of the tall perennials that you can grow. Most of them that we're going to talk about are going to get at least four feet tall, up to six feet, and some of them even seven feet. And if you take a look at the one we're walking up close to now, this is one of the Rudbeckia varieties, the Herbston. Now I have to admit, sometimes when I plant plants, I don't pay very close attention to how big, how tall it's going to get. And this is a perfect example of that. I, I thought this was going to be one of the shorter Rudbeckia varieties, but look at this. This is, oh my goodness, I mean, I'm 5'8", and this is probably upwards now of uh, over six feet, probably going to get seven feet. And this is all in the same growing season. Now I'm not crazy about the location. It's right next to this mountain sentinel aspen, but we could always move it. But it's funny how even when you put a plant in the wrong location, you kind of get used to it. But let's take a look at some of the details on this great perennial. One of the most common, common names on this perennial is autumn sun. Yeah, and you can see why it gets that name. Now the autumn sun or Rubeckia herbston variety, this thing is one of the late bloomers. We're into about mid-August now. This has been blooming now, gosh, I think at least a couple weeks. One of the things I've really noticed in the evening or the early morning as the sun is setting or coming up, this thing almost just glows and it just sticks out. You notice it out the window or if you're out walking in the yard early. As you can see in there, we've got some honeybees in there, so it looks like it's going to be a good pollinator for us. I was also surprised that we had a recent windstorm. I had a Swedish aspen that blew down in a wind gust. This thing wasn't affected at all. Now, that might have been that it was just protected enough, but these stems have held up really, really well. You'll also sometimes hear this perennial referred to as a cone flower. It's not in the Echinacea genus like the purple coneflower, some of the other fancy colors. This is in the Rudbeckia genus. And right behind our autumn sun Rudbeckia, we're gonna take a look at Culver's root. Now this was a plant that I purchased, it was considered a native strain of the Culver's root. And the flowers, they've pretty much finished. They have this white candelabra-like spike and a, kind of a unique little plant. I wasn't sure what to expect when we first put it in. The culver's root is hardy to zone three, and it's interesting to note that these spike flowers open from the bottom up midsummer. It does great in full sun, it's going to tolerate part shade, and it does prefer a moist, well drained soil. Mature plants can reach heights of six feet, and it's just a great one for attracting pollinators. And here's another culver's root right back here. You can see the flowering is completely done on that, but it's still kind of interesting to look at, even when that flowering is done with that tall spike. I'm really looking forward to see how this develops over the years, if it's going to spread out. It's just an absolutely new perennial to me, and I've kind of been more interested in some of the more native strains, rather than all the perennials that are bred uh, more for a shorter, more compact. That's why we're taking a look at some of these taller ones, and that's where you can find some of the taller perennials. It's in their native species that hasn't been bred. And right behind us here in one of our other beds, we're going to go take a look at one of the aster varieties. Now, this was actually here when we purchased this location, I'm not sure the exact variety. There's many different asters. They can be anywhere from one up to six feet. The asters are often grouped into a couple distinct groups, the New York asters or the New England asters. And it's just different variations on the type of leaf, type of flower. Like I said, I'm not sure the variety in this, but what I do love about this aster here is it just gets big. It's like four to five feet tall. It's one of the last plants in our yard that's in full bloom, even sometimes into mid-October, upwards of November, right before winter comes in. But look at the amount of honeybees on this plant. And we love that because we actually have a small honeybee hive. I'm probably the most amateur honeybee guy you're going to find. Take a quick look here. We did our honey harvest. Oh gosh, I guess that was about mid-August, same time we're doing this video. But we ended up with about five gallons of honey. And we only took about half of it out of these five boxes. So it's really quite an adventure to do it. It's a whole day's process to harvest that honey. Here's what we're doing, something called, we're taking the caps off. And then we just put it in this, I don't know, it's a centrifuge or a spinning type tool that it separates the honey from the honeycomb. So I highly recommend it if you're in an area that you can actually be a hobby apiary bee farmer. It's well worth it, especially if you've got perennials and you want to have a pollinator garden. It's fun to see your bees, which different plants they're attracted to.
Okay, this aster, it is getting a little bit bigger than we like and it's right in the front of this garden. So now what we've decided to start doing, I've started to do divisions on it. And this spring, I took out, I think, three pretty good sized clumps. And here is one of those aster clumps. You know, that thing was only, I don't know, about 12 inches by 12 inches. Look at that, not very big, but it's coming in gangbusters. I'm almost worried that I put it in the wrong spot. It's gonna be competing with this yellow scotch pine we've got here pretty quick. So we'll see what happens. Depending on the season, we can get some of this different browning on the lower foliage. But when you get those flowers that come out, you really don't notice it. It's just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful plant. Can't recommend the asters enough to get that fall blooming in your gardens, in your landscapes. Now we're coming up on a Heliopsis. This is also sometimes called false sunflower oxeye daisy. And this actually started out as a smaller variety called the Lorraine Sunshine, a variegated variety. If you look back in here, you can kind of see that variegation on that leaf. But what's happened over time, it self-seeded itself here. And it comes up in a lot of areas. I've actually been pulling it. I don't want it to completely take over. But the original Heliopsis with those seeds, these can get up into that, oh, good four, maybe five feet. But I think this is a pretty good average height. So a nice tall perennial. But if you take a look here, these seeds are already starting to mature. And if you want to get something going and naturalize an area, yeah, you can have just hundreds, if not thousands of seeds that you can go ahead and get that started in location. So a great plant for naturalizing. And this has got, I tell you what, I think over a two month bloom period. It's starting to finish up now, but early on that bright yellow off in the distance, just a favorite thing of mine to do, that yellow contrast here and there in the landscape. This is one of my overgrown beds and I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. And I cut this back to the ground, a lot of that nine bark in there last fall. I will get a video out on this eventually. I think later this fall into the winter, I'll work on it in the studio. But look at how much growth I've got in this. When I cut it back, it was a jungle. And man, it's back to a jungle. So might have to start removing some of those plants in there. Just a little bit too congested for me. Okay, let's go ahead. Let's go over to one of them. I think you're just going to love this. This is Prairie Blazing Star. Would you look at that? This also stood up in that recent windstorm. Thought for sure this was going to go down. Look at that. Yeah, the flowers here too. They're starting to finish up. You can see a lot of the petals there. They've dropped off. But what a great little upright spiky purple perennial. And this bed that you see here, this is one we're trying to naturalize it again with more of the pure, more native type strains of wildflowers. But this has also been an excellent pollinator. It draws in all types of different bees, different little insects. But what a beautiful plant. There's so many different blazing star varieties. But what you have to be careful of, there's a variety called Kobold, commonly sold in the garden centers. It's not a very good pollinator. So in the breeding programs, that type of attractant to the insects has been kind of, it's disappeared. So if you like the insects, the pollinators, and you want that, you're gonna have to go towards some of the more original strains. And tucked way in the backdrop, in this natural bed that we've got going, we've got goldenrod. You can see it right there. It's not flowering yet, just starting. This is gonna have a yellow flower on those tall stems. They're just starting to come out. Now there's different varieties of the golden rod that stay much shorter. Again, this is one of the more native strains, native seed source, and this can easily get up above five feet. The golden rods do have a bit of a spreading habit. They can take over areas. You have to be careful there. And there's a misconception that golden rod is responsible for a lot of the fall allergies. But if you do some research on it, you'll find that apparently it's got a pretty sticky flower. So it really doesn't go airborne. It's considered that ragweed is probably the one that's causing the hay fever, the allergies, since that one blooms about the same time. And now we're coming up on one of my favorites, Joe Pie Weed. If you're not growing this perennial, you really should give this one a try. Look at these bumblebees. Well, yeah, this is always just really fun to watch. And it's funny, almost every time I recommend this plant to somebody and I say the name Joe Pye Weed, immediately it's like, why would I want to plant that? I don't want a weed, so it's got kind of a bad common name, but it's anything but a weed. It's in the genus, the Eupatorium, and this is a slow one to emerge. That soil has to warm up. It was one of the last ones 
to come out of the ground. But boy, once we start getting that warm weather, this Joe pie weed, just absolutely fantastic. Bumblebees love it, butterflies love it. Just a favorite tall perennial. Gets up into that four feet for us, but I think it can get into the five to even six feet, depending on where you grow it. These large pink flowers, they're a favorite nectar for many butterflies, including the monarchs, the swallowtails. It does great in full sun, but it's gonna thrive in part shade and woodlands as well. And it's hardy to zone four. It'll tolerate some wet soils, but avoid overly dry soils. Now I think in my zone four, five to six feet is about the maximum that we're gonna get for our short growing season. But I have read that this can get up to 12 feet in warmer zones. And back to our original starting point next to our autumn sun, the Herbston Rudbeckia variety. Hey, thanks for stopping by Garden Hike. I appreciate it. We'll see you again next video.